Um, if times were different, would you have been happy to have been a test pilot testing the ejection seat? Well, I mean, I was a navigator, so I would never have been a test pilot. Yeah, that's true. But I wanted yeah. to test ejection seats. Absolutely not. I mean, you know, when this is the 1940s, we're still talking about aircraft like the Lancaster, uh, you know, where pilots or what a crew strapped a parachute on or they sat on a parachute or something like that. The concept of uh, then testing ejection seats, a previously unheard of invention, is beyond comprehension. And Benny Lynch, the chap who did it, was an amazing guy who volunteered to test them on the ground, on the test rig on the ground, and then test them in the air. And he'd never been airborne before. You know, so he was sent off on a parachuting course by James Martin. He was just a, a fitter in James Martin's aircraft factory. He was just a bloke working, building, building stuff. And he went off on a parachuting course. Uh, and he uh, and he ended up uh, being he ejecting out of aircraft. I think he did it 15 or 20 times or something which is an astonishing thing to be doing, if you think about it. You that now, having no experience in going out and testing. Hi, guys. I'm so, so sorry to interrupt. We've had a few technical problems. Unfortunately, internet went down from our end. So I'm hoping um, you, you are joining us on Facebook Live now. We've just checked. YouTube, if you can't see us on YouTube, apologies. Um, but if you want to join in Facebook Live, if you can't see us on YouTube, I apologise again, John, Steve, but I'll leave you to it because we are live. <laughs> okay. Um, Where were you, Steve? Right. Welcome back. Um, Ron Guthrie's story is almost a book mm -hmm. inside a book. Um, yeah. What he went through was horrendous. Uh, did you ever think, should I put his story in this book or write another one solely on him? Yeah, that's a good question. Ron Guthrie was the first person to eject in combat in the uh, early 1950s in Korea. He was shot down by uh, a Soviet, uh, a Soviet uh, Russian uh, fighter, uh, and he ejected, first combat ejection, ejected at 38,000 feet on a manual seat. So he was in the seat, uh, he was in the parachute coming down, I think, for 27 minutes floating down and he was captured by the Korean forces. And uh, it he had a pretty tough time, uh, a tough time, uh, a fairly brutal experience. But as you know, other people, whether it was in Vietnam or in the Gulf had equally as brutal ex uh, experiences, in fact, Vietnam, possibly more so. So, you know, I mean, the thing is, for me, it's the journey of the seat and the people. And so you can't just, you couldn't just concentrate on one person. I had to concentrate on all of those people from 1940 all the way through to today. Yeah, um, just reading the book and the amount of stories in, in it, they're all fascinating stories that you think, oh, that could be a book on itself. <laughs> so, so. Um, I never knew until I read the book that um, I needed to know so much about the ejection seat. Um, I found it extremely well written and it kept me interested right until the end. Um, you've written this book superbly and in keeping it informative and easy to read, Thanks, which is talented. very good for people with who like <laughs> me. Um, would you say Guy Gruters um, yeah. was lucky or unlucky? Well, Guy is uh, was one of my... Guy could have five books of his own uh, in actual fact. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so the story of Guy Gruters... I uh, was a, Viet a pilot in the uh, United States Air Force in the 1960s. Uh, young man went into the Air Force Academy in 1961, I think. Uh, trained to fly, became a pilot on the F-100 Super Saber and ended up in Vietnam uh, for a 12-month tour, as almost all of them did then. Uh, 11 months into the guy's tour, he was shot down with his co-pilot, Charlie Neal, uh, and they... They, uh, they, they managed to fly their aircraft blazing in flames uh, for about four or five minutes till they got out over one of the, uh, uh, one of the gulfs, one of the deltas uh, of Vietnam, and they managed to eject just before the aircraft exploded. But they were still very close to the Vietnam coast, only kind of 100 yards or something. And so the Vietnamese were trying to get to them in boats to capture them. Uh, the, the most amazing combat rescue uh, unfolded. So if you remember scenes from Apocalypse Now or something like that, the helicopters are coming in, guns blazing, the fighters are coming in, uh, dropping bombs. The, you know, the, this mini war is going on in this little delta. 
Uh, Guy and Charlie are captured. Guy goes back to America, to Florida, to, uh, to see his wife for two weeks' leave. Uh, and he says, right, well, my love, I've got, uh, I've got four weeks of my Vietnam tour to do. So I'm back to Vietnam now. I'll see you in a month. He went back. Two days later, he was shot down again and he was captured and he didn't go home for five and a half years. He was a prisoner of war for five and a half years. So his wife didn't know if he was alive or dead for much of that time. His daughters grew up without a father. They were, I think, seven or six and three at the time. So they grew up not knowing a father. They forgot that they had a father as, uh, unless they looked at pictures. And his experience I think is the most brutal of the book because the stories that you hear of the way American prisoners were tr treated in Vietnam is horrific. His story is horrific. He, uh, he watched one of his best friends being beaten to death uh, almost in front of his eyes. Um, he, he lost many friends. They went through cruelty and deprivation and depravity and torture for five and a half years. And his journey of ejection. So the ejection seat saved his life. Pulling the handle saved his life, but it catapulted him into a horrendous experience. But he's alive to tell the tale and he would regard himself as lucky. Yes. Um, I guess being shot down twice and surviving both and then surviving the war, I guess he is lucky, but also I'm lucky for being shot down twice as well. Yeah, I guess. very much so. <laughs> the Vietnam chapters were exceptional um, and again so well written um, and the stories are really horrific aren't they what yeah. we went through and what, the, what his colleagues went through as well so um, yeah, the, 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 war, war is a brutal horrible awful thing there's no doubt about it mm. uh, interestingly yeah, Steve I was chatting to Guy only last week and him and Charlie his mate that he was shot down with they went back to Vietnam they were in Vietnam last month uh, and they went back and, Char uh, and um, Guy visited the Hanoi Hilton, which was the prison in uh, Vietnam. He went back and he met some of the people, the Vietnamese there. And as is so often the case, you know, they, 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 you know, friends would be wrong, but, you know, they respected each other and they got, they got on with their lives. And, he, you know, for him, it was a journey of discovery and redemption. And there's a couple of those. Was that, in the, book. Was that the first time he... Gone back, yeah, or had you been it was the before? first time he'd gone back uh, in and been back to that prison. Yeah, really, re really incredible. A, I've got a picture of him outside the prison. He just sent me. It. Wow, Too that must have been strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, going on to the Falklands War, um, that was the first war that I remember as a child. Mm -hmm. I can recall the TV footage being quite graphic. Um, one sentence really hit home though, and that was how unprepared, how untrained some of the Argentinians were. Uh, when I read they were trying to shoot down one of their own stricken aircraft and they still missed. Um, that sort of hits home, doesn't it? At the, how unprepared some of them were. I think, I mean, un, un, unprepared, I think we were, I think everybody was unprepared. It was the first major conflict that the Brits had been involved in since Korea, I suppose. So nobody, there was nobody with any real combat experience in the, in the UK mil military, not, I mean, Northern Ireland, I, I mean, real... Uh, war fighting with, uh, you know, on the scale that we did in the Falklands, sending an expeditionary force 11,000 miles. Um, and so I don't think anybody was particularly prepared. One of the great problems that the Argentinians had was that, uh, you know, some of their ejection seats, uh, the, 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 the cartridges in the, the, that make the ejection were out of date. And because of the regime that they uh, that they were currently uh, living under, the, nobody would resupply them, and so the air crew who were flying um, the Argentinian jets. And again, there's a number of stories in there, uh, and I spoke to a number of people involved uh, at that time. They uh, so first of all, they didn't know if their ejection seat would work if they needed it, and there's a couple of stories there of utter tragedy where ejection seats didn't work and we know what happened because we found the aircraft and we found the body, there clearly may well have been other ones that we don't know what happened. And the, 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 the Falklands chapter starts with one of the guys uh, the year before ejecting uh, off the back of the Argentinian carrier and his ejection seat didn't work properly. And his story is absolutely astonishing. But then he led his men into battle. And I think what's important about it is that the Argentinian pilots, 
uh, were as brave as any. You know, they were they were flying at the very limits of their endurance, at the very limits of what they were trying to do, at the very limits of the aircraft's uh, capabilities, and they were still heading into battle uh, on a on a de near daily basis. Um, and you know, as you can as you read in the book, some of them were shot down, some of them lost their lives, as did, of course, many of the Brits. Um, one I talk about one who was captured, and then as is right and proper, properly treated by the British and the British military and the British medical services. Um, and um, and another guy, you know, one guy who was shot down and managed to evade and uh, got rescued. And I'm sure you'll come to it later, how some of those people involved went on their own journey of redemption 20 mm. years after the Falklands War. Yeah. At the end, the end of the book is fascinating and what you've written and um, I don't want to spoil it for anyone. But, um, well, maybe we'll talk so... about it at the end of this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, going on about the um, being captured, uh, reading the accounts of Greeks, Guthrie, Brutus, Tico, Slade and yourself, thinking back to the Second World War and the accounts back then, the story of torture of captured personnel, it all sounds horrific. It makes you wonder what our ways of extracting information was. Um, were you prepared at how bad the treatment was going to be to you? Um, well, I mean, again, so the, so the Gulf War where I ejected, um, uh, again, none of us in the military at that time, maybe one or two had been in the Falklands, but it was very, very rare um, in, the, in, in the Air Force world. Um, and we had no experience of combat. We'd never flown the tornado in uh, in combat before uh, and so the on the honest answer is we were absolutely totally unprepared we had no idea what was going to happen we had no idea what we'd face we had no idea about the threat level we had no idea about the air defenses the reality of the ground uh the simple AAA, the, the the machine guns in modern parlance and the effect that they would have and so i don't think we were prepared uh, other than as much as you can prepare yourself to go to war. Uh, but in, the, in reality, and as I say so many times during the book, nobody expects they're going to eject. Nobody gets up in the morning and thinks, right, I'm going off either to fly in a peacetime training mission or to fly in a uh, combat mission. They don't expect to eject. And so it is your last chance pulling that, pulling that black and yellow handle, that, that, that's the Martin Baker one, that's mine that I was presented with in the aftermath of the Gulf War. Pulling that handle is your last ditch chance to survive. And so there is no other option. What you face after the journey that you go on is an integral part of the book. Was I prepared? No, definitely not. Definitely not. No, it's, it is pretty horrific, isn't it? Um, and I had a question from someone earlier. Um, they said, were you told any stories to make up or um, any intel to sort of give people your captures? Mm. So that would be a kind of a cover story type thing. No, uh, yes. we, never, yeah. we never went in for anything like that in the Air Force. We were still actually um, rather bound by old fashioned rules of number, rank, name, date of birth, uh, which kind of right. didn't work. Somebody stuffing a cigarette out on your nose or something like that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so so no, we would never, we just wouldn't go into that. It's changed slightly now. Again, the military was not prepared for its pr the prisoners of war and what they went through. You know, people did not understand uh, the the reality of what was going to happen. And the military and the air force in particular have changed its guidelines, changed its instructions in the aftermath of our experiences. But you know, the right. Falklands. Sorry, the, the 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 Gulf is a classic example of that journey of ejection. So as you know, one of the people that I talk about is Larry Slade, who's a mate of mine who was flying the uh, F-14, the Tomcat of Top Gun fame. He was the Rio, the backseater, and he was with his pilot, Devin Jones. They were shot down about three days after me. Uh, Larry was captured and ended up with me and Tico and a few and lots of the other guys you know, tortured, being paraded on TV, six weeks of brutality, his pilot mm. was rescued. 
And there's a picture in the book, as you know, Steve, of uh, that was taken by one of the special forces guys on the rescue helicopter that had flown in with, you know, A-10 tank busters kind of attacking troops on the ground, protection going on, this amazing firefight. And there's a picture in the book taken by one of the special forces guys. And it's taken out the side of the, the rescue helicopter. So you can see the winch hanging down in front of the camera. And you can see one of the special forces soldiers on the ground and he's got his rifle leveled at some of the uh, at somebody behind Devon. Devon is running. He's just all you can see is this picture of this airman running like that, uh, sprinting towards the helicopter. And one of the special forces guys on the on the has got an old fashioned camera with film in it, if anybody remembers that. And he takes a picture. <laughs> yeah. It's an iconic, it's an iconic picture of uh, a combat situation. It's yeah, that's yeah, that's it there. Yeah, so you can see if in the top left there, you can just keep it up there for a second. See, put, put move it over to your left there. Perfect. So you can see the winch uh, hanging from the the top of the helicopter. Um, Devon's down there in the left, and he's running towards the aircraft. There's a special forces soldier on the right uh, who's giving him cover. And thanks very much, Steve. And that that uh, is the for me that signifies the journey of and the reality of ejection seats. So Larry, captured, tortured, prisoner of war, paraded on TV, nearly killed. Devon, rescued, survived. And Devon went back to the carrier, and he was flying ops again, I think, two days later. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, an amazing story. It is, it is. Um, <laughs> one of the stories um, that made me smile was Des Maloney. Yes. And just how how remarkably funny, well, how remarkably lucky he was. A, a remarkably <laughs> unfunny, if you think about it. Yeah, unfunny, um, but remarkably lucky. Um, so Des was flying with his brother, Tom. They were both civilians. And so they had, uh, Tom had brought him, bought himself a, a jet provost. Jet provost. So what, yeah. one of our old training aircraft, I think, again, there's a picture in the book uh, in, in that section, Steve. He bought himself uh, an old jet provost. He was a civvy. It's a, one of the RAF's old jet trainers. It's what I did my nav training on back in 1987 or something like that. We'd be, you know, there is a I think there are 1960s jet aircraft. He <clears> bought this thing uh, to fly around a little pleasure, like a little pleasure plane, but it was a, com a jet. <laughs> um, uh, and he took his brother flying. He took Des flying. Um, and... Uh, they had the, the the aircraft got ejection seats in it, um, but they were they were they were inert. They've been told that they weren't operative, uh, in which they weren't. They were you know they mm. they had the uh, they were not operative. They had the charges taken out of them. But um, what happened was uh, so Tom's flying around and he does a, a little loop, uh, and Des feels the seat move, and before he knows it, he's the seat has smashed through the cockpit of the aircraft. It's fallen out of the aircraft. And Des is in an inert ejection seat, falling through the sky. And, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's beyond comprehension of what he went through. I think, again, I won't spoil the story um, too much. But uh, because of the way the seat had been set up, it wasn't as inert as everybody thought. And I let's just say I interviewed Des about his experiences, but he needed a new pair of underpants that day. <laughs> I'm sure he did. To have no training and do what he did, he was very lucky. <laughs> You're very, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, the statistics regarding the training accidents, um, I found really interesting. Uh, the, the fatalities and horrendous, especially the percentage of losses since 1960 to 1995. Um, and that's with the ejection seats. The percentage mm -hmm. was so much higher, it seems. Um, is that a sign that more needs to be done? Uh, no, I mean, the, the, if you're talking about the number of losses in the 60s and the 70s, is that what you mean, Steve? Well, um, yeah, all through from 60 to 95, the, the percentage well, seems a lot I, higher. I, mean, I, think that is, I think that if you look at the, at the 60s and 70s, first of all, the number of aircraft crashes was astronomical, but the number of aircraft that we had was astronomical as well. But it was a, a modern military aviation is a it's a dangerous old game. You know, it's a, mm. never mind war. Modern military aviation is a dangerous game. 
Uh, and so, you know, accidents were normal. I remember uh, when I did my flying authorizers course, which is kind of a, a supervisory role on a squadron when you've got a bit more experience. Um, I was told that the RAF, so this would have been, what, 93, something like that, 94. The RAF budgeted to lose 12 aircraft a year and 12 or 15 aircrew lives. They budgeted for that many deaths. Mm. That's how they trained, that's what they budgeted for. So they trained more people knowing that 12 or 15 a year would be killed. Well, <laughs> that's just that, was the, that was the reality of modern military flying. As you know, in the book, that there are people killed in modern military flying. There are people who are lucky and their lives are saved. But it's an, an inherently dangerous process. It's not easy. It's, uh, it's no. difficult, dangerous, it's hazardous. But if you want to fully train combat military, that's the reality. Yeah. Um, the tornadoes colliding, um, that must have been so frightening that a speed of a thousand miles an hour yeah. combined speed, that must have been horrendous. Yeah. Um, so the, sorry, go ahead. No, go on, my friend. Go on. Um, Mid-air collisions, people might find this quite difficult to believe, but mid-air collisions in the, well, all the way through from the 60s, 70s, 80s and into the 90s were fairly common, fairly standard. People think people, you know, and I've tried to explain in the book, it's quite complex, but people think that if you're flying a tornado or a Harrier or an A-10 or a helicopter or a Hercules or anything at low level, and anybody who lived in, a, in an area like uh, Wales or Northumberland, uh, or mid Scotland, where there was sometimes on in days you could have a hundred combat aircraft whizzing around the skies doing different stuff from different squadrons and different bases around the UK and about around Europe. There's no air traffic control. This isn't like when you go on your holiday uh, and somebody says, recline to uh, 30,000 feet and turn left and approach Greece before you go on your holiday. It's not like that. It's called see and avoid. That's the mm. system at low level for combat aircraft, helicopters, transport aircraft, things like that. When you're down at low level, so in the UK, you could be flying at 250 feet, maybe in the uh, 550, 600 miles an hour. You could then, you could be mixed in with helicopters flying at 100 feet and 100 miles an hour. Hercules transport flying at 250 feet and 250 miles an hour. You see and avoid. And so... It's like you driving down the M1 on a busy day or around the M25 if you live where we do. You basically, you look ahead, you don't, you think, you, know, you think, right, I need to avoid that car. You're just aware that there's another car there. You're aware yeah. that uh, there's cars coming over from here on the left, joining the motorway. You're aware that there might be bad weather. Oh, well, loads of people aren't aware because they're terrible drivers, but that's a different interview mm. to do. Um, you know, you're aware that, Somebody might be coming from behind you, somebody overtaking you. You're aware that something's happening over there. And so, you know, it's that's what you're doing when you're flying. But you're doing it at 550, 600 miles an hour and 250 feet in three dimensions. So you're doing it mm. speed, in up and down, back and forwards. And, you know, it's and mid-air collisions were normal. I mean, absolutely normal. Uh, and... Uh, you are lucky to get out of a, a, a mid-air collision, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, Steve Griggs ejecting twice in just 16 weeks. Um, that's not the surprising part. The surprising part was the amount of number of ejections between the first and the second for me. That so you'll have to remind me, have, I, you, have you written it down? Because I can't remember how many there no, were. No, I haven't written it down. I think you might so know. He, uh, well, I, I could, I, he um, he ejected first when he was shot down by accident. Um, so he was in Germany flying his Jaguar. Uh, he was just returning to base, and a Phantom had taken off from another base. And as was the Cape Norm in Germany at the time, or in the, all of our combat air forces, uh, some of the fighter aircraft would do practice interceptions on the bomber aircraft to practice their skills, to hone their techniques, and. Uh, an aircraft from RF Wildenrath had taken off. Uh, very unusually, it was armed because of an exercise had been going on. Um, yeah, so um, the aircraft took off and it did a practice interception on Steve, who was just 
approaching his own airfield to land and go off and have his lunch. Uh, <laughs> and the pilot did a practice interception and pulled the trigger, which should have taken a picture. Um, but it didn't take a picture. It launched a missile. Uh, and Steve was shot down. Uh, astonishing story. Um, and he went back to flying, I think, two or three days later. And he was then ejected again 16 weeks later. Um, yeah. and, uh, and he was lucky to get out of that aircraft as well, which basically burst into flames. Yes, yeah. Um, there's a lot of deaths in the book, um, but there's also a lot of survival stories. Um, did you enjoy writing it? I did, yeah. It's, uh, it was really interesting. It, you know, because many of the people I interviewed, were, I was interviewing with my mates much of the time. Uh, yeah. And I hadn't heard their stories. It's quite that interesting because uh, I don't know, is that Jude who's just asked the question, were there any funny, unexpected stories that surprised you? I mean, uh, do you know what? All of the stories surprised me, even the ones I thought I knew. So the one, so there's the one, one of the mid-air collisions was a mate of mine on from my base. Uh, he ejected, lucky, to, very lucky to survive, but bro snapped both his legs uh, because he was unconscious when he landed. Um, his story of his wife, who was really annoyed with him for not getting home for dinner that night, when she was told that he'd had an accident, she thought that he'd been to the bar and fallen off his bicycle on the way home. I <laughs> couldn't quite understand. Uh, and uh, the, the person doing the notification, the knock at the door, said, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, he's had a, an accident, a mid-air accident. And she thought, what? He's been doing stupid jumps on his bike and showing off. And it was, you know, it took her kind of 30 seconds to understand that her husband was near near death's door and in hospital yeah. back in the UK. Um, and so, you know, there were, there's, there, are, there are a number of really quite extraordinary and quite funny stories in there as well. Though I guess if you've snapped both your legs, you don't find them funny at the time. <laughs> Not at the time, though, but I suppose if your wife doesn't believe you, she, 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 she thinks yeah. she's falling out. Damn it, oh, then that's probably why. Um, this is the last question from me. It's a bit of a light-hearted one, and then we'll go on to the questions from Facebook, if there's any. Um, if you had a tattoo, would it be 6089? <laughs> that's a very good question. I've got, I should, I should have brought it up. I didn't bring it with me. I've got my Bremont uh, ejection watch. So right. anybody who's ejected and is a member of the Martin Baker uh, club, is entitled to have a, a very special, very exclusive watch uh, that only people who have ejected can have. And that's got my number engraved on it and the date. I don't have any tattoos, Steve, and I think no. I'm probably a bit old to be considering them now. <laughs> right. um, should we go on to the questions for Facebook, if there are any? Do you know if there are any Facebook questions, Julia? Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry about the technical hitches again. Uh, yeah, so it should have popped up, but we've got a question from Jude who wants to ask John: Do you have any plans for a book about Ted Bear at all? <laughs> so this is this is quite a niche question because it's a, bit, um, a a question about my dog. In fact, in actual fact, Jude, a question about the dog that we don't have anymore. That sadly is no longer with us. You mean Ralph Retriever, uh, who is lying around? outside somewhere um uh no i think that i'm going to stick with aviation themed books rather than uh, dog themed books hello ralphie come here come on here come here so keep, you keep see i don't know if you can see can you see the questions here you go. Here's, um, here's here's the here's the giant that is yeah ralph retriever um, go on off you go ralph, hi again steve if you, uh, if you oh, can't okay. see the the question, sorry. Hey, Ralph, was it Ralphie? Yeah, it's got Ralphie. He's, he's, been, he's been sent back again. Oh. I can uh, I can see the questions. Uh, so uh, some of the stories about Jetties and their families had not been told before. Why do you think we've never heard about their experiences before now? Well, why, why, why don't people talk about their experiences? Because most of the time, people in the military don't think anybody would be interested in their experiences of the reality. For us, their day-to-day -day experiences. 
the death of a friend is a day-to-day -day occurrence. The uh, an ejection, oh sorry, was a day-to-day -day occurrence back back when I was flying. Uh, you didn't fly along in the air force before you a friend was killed. That's just a reality. Uh, but you just didn't really talk about them that much. And it's not until you sit down with somebody for a, uh, an extended period of time, which is what I've done in the book. Um, you know, the, the whole point is, you know, it's not a it's not a small book. It's 150,000 words. And the stories. So. So, for instance, the story of uh, the guy who had the midair collision, uh, who just survived but snapped his legs. I interviewed the person who he had the midair collision with. I, I found the story about the person on the ground who'd rescued him, the AA patrolman outside Hexham. You know, I told his story as part of the overall thing. I told the story of his wife. I told the story of the surgeon who fixed his legs. These are the most important things because they rather than just say, oh, yeah, he ejected then. This is what happened. His aircraft crashed. Uh, he was badly injured, but he's OK. It becomes a human story of survival, which is what I always want to try and tell. I think there's that. Uh, uh, what altitude were you and John at when you ejected from your tornado? Was it painful? Uh, well, my, myself, Daryl, so that's Daryl. Uh, Daryl, myself and my pilot, uh, John Peters, um, ejected. Well, we were hit by a heat-seeking missile at about, I think, we were about 30 feet and 600 miles an hour. But we ejected at about, because uh, we were on fire, JP managed to get control of the aircraft and, and right it a little bit. And we had about 10 seconds to try to decide what we were going to do. So I think we were probably about 130, 180 feet. Was it painful? No. Uh, because of the modern seat, they are uh, they're rocket seats. So um, if you look at, uh, so the, this is the picture on the back of the book, my book. Uh, sorry, too much light there. Uh, that is uh, Martin Pert ejecting in Afghanistan. If you look at that, his Harrier is burning. It's caught fire. He's crashed on the runway. That you can see the rocket, you can see his legs dangling from the seat and the rocket coming out seemingly under his backside. Well, it is under his backside. Um, you know, so but it's a, a graduated thrust now. So it can still injure you, there's no doubt about it. But it's so instantaneous, so automatic from pulling the handle. So that you pull that handle, and two and a half seconds later, you're under the parachute. So it's almost instantaneous to all intents and purposes. Uh, now Sandra. from Sandra. Sorry, go ahead. Steve. Uh, my, my bookcase is a shrine to John Nicol. Uh, <laughs> what, what is your next book going to be about? Aha! Uh -huh. Well, I do like anybody who's got a bookcase that's a shrine to me. I hope that you're <laughs> buying your books from your local independent bookshop. Uh, the book next book, I'm all, I'm kind of, gosh, maybe twenty percent through, but it's a secret at the minute because it's a complete departure. This one, something that I've never done, I haven't done before. It's a departure for me. Uh, so it's very much under wraps until much nearer publication date, which will be next year. But it's definitely not about your dog. Sorry, it's not about my dog, no. It's definitely not, your, not about your dog. Definitely not. It's not a dog-related <laughs> book. Um, uh, Fate of Goose in Top Gun, is that possible or happened? Or happened. So Goose, if anybody remembers Goose, who's the Rio in the... the um, the F-14 in, uh, so the rear seat um, in the F-14 uh, Tomcat, he hits his head on the canopy as he ejects. Is it possible or has it happened? It is absolutely possible. Not quite the way it happened with Goose, but uh, one of the cases in the book that I talk about just before a mid-air collision was a friend of mine uh, who uh, almost certainly impacted his head on the side of the uh, the the canopy as he ejected and sadly was killed, uh, and so yes, it can happen. Yes, it's possible. Yes, it's happened. Another one from Sarah. Um, do you find it difficult to write about your experiences? Well, I think this is a very interesting point because although I've been talking about uh, my experiences, in actual fact, I'm not even in this book, apart from kind of on a couple of pages where I meet one of the guys who's a prisoner of war in Iraq. So I'm not in this book. I've written about my experiences before. Um, am I, is it difficult to write about? Well, it was 32 years ago, to be honest. So 
Am I, is, is it difficult to write about? Not really. Uh, I've written about it before. It's difficult the first time because not really spoken about it, but not anymore, to be perfectly honest. Um, another one uh, from Jude. Um, what aircraft would you have loved to have flown or fly these days that you haven't flown already and why? Uh, thank you, Jude. Um, I don't like flying at all. Um, it's, I'm not one of these people that loves flying. Um, I, um, I was never a massive fan of flying. It made me feel quite airsick at points. Um, and I've been lucky enough to, to – I did a program for Discovery Channel, God, 20 years ago now, 15 years ago, where I went around the world. So I had a trip in a, light, an, a lightning fighter in South Africa, a Hercules, an F-18, which is the new air, the aircraft in the new Top Gun movie. I had a trip in that. Uh, the Hunter. What else? Oh, the um, MiG-29. I went to Russia and I had a trip in a MiG-29. Uh, and so I've been lucky enough to fly quite a few different aircraft. But I wouldn't want it. I'm just, you know, I'm quite happy on the ground or or perhaps in business class, flying to Florida on holiday or something like that. That's about the limit of my flying these days. How, how frightening was the lightning to be in? Uh, well, I think probably I didn't find it frightening. It was an amazing experience. You know, anybody who knows the lightning... Um, would you know knows that its its rate of climb was incredible and it was famous for taking off the end of the runway on its tail and climbing to thirty thousand feet in a in a matter of kind of I don't know what it was twenty or thirty seconds and I did that in South Africa it was amazing I didn't feel scared I think I probably would now and in actual fact um, tragedy befell the guy who took me flying in that lightning in uh, in South Africa he was mm. killed in a crash a few years later um in the, in that lightning um and uh, you know that uh, a, a terrible story so i just see it was that in cape town yeah cape town in thunder city yeah, it's not yeah. they don't, they, it's all gone now i don't think they have it anymore mm. um but yeah you know i mean it's an inherently did i wouldn't do it now you know if i was offered a trip in one of these old aircraft, you know, oh, do you want to go and fly with your mates and somewhere down there in a hunter or a gnat? You know, not a chance am I going to go and do that. No way. <laughs> um, there's another question from Sam. Um, where else do you think we could employ ejector seats in everyday life? Um, well, I mean, that's a really good point, possibly made slightly in jest. I mean, obviously, we know that James Bond's got one, had one in his car, but... You know, it's really quite important that if you look at something like um, there's a system on motorbikes, and I saw it was, it was on 999 Rescue or something the other night, that um, they now have a, a suit um, that uh, if they come off their bike, they have a, a trip uh, cord which is attached to their bike, and the suit, I think, inflates uh, to provide them with protection when they hit the ground. And so there are similar survival and escape systems available for other things. And, you know, if you look now, simple things like if you look at your car, now, the, you know, you, you used to have a crash in a car and you were lucky if you had a seatbelt. But now you look at the airbags now and there yeah. are airbags everywhere, you know, down the side, in front of you, behind you, on your neck, you know, above, but everything will really protect you if you crash. And so the technology is... Uh, is being used to protect and save lives. Yeah, correct. Um, there's a really good question here from Andrew. Um, there are so many wonderful stories in the book with many more to tell. Will there be a Jet to Jet volume two? Uh, there won't be. It's a, people always ask me this. Oh, why didn't you do another book? Well, because the whole book is Eject to Jet is about the story of the ejection seat. And the stories that I have chosen to illustrate that are the stories which illustrate the, the, the arc, the journey of the ejection seat from 1942 through to today. Uh, it's not just a collection of people's experiences of ejecting. So there can't be another one because I can't tell the same story again. I can't tell the story of the ejection seat again. Or it, so it would just be a collection of stories of people who ejected. And I don't do that kind of book. Um, another one from Sarah. Uh, between you and the pilot, who makes the final decision to eject? 
Um, it can be either. Uh, there's stories in the book. Um, some of it is mutual. So myself and my pilot, John Peters, when we ejected, uh, we knew we were going to have to do it because the aircraft was on fire. We did a few final things. I broadcast a mayday call. Uh, uh, and we, you know, we literally said, right, stand by, stand by, three, two, one, eject, eject, pull the handle together, even though the, the system separates you slightly. Um, story in the book of um, Ian Weaver, a mate of mine who was in a tornado, a three mid-air collision, nearly killed. He remembers nothing uh, of the day of, at all. Still, 30, 20, 28 years on, remembers nothing of the day. Uh his pilot ejected them both after they had a mid-air collision. And that, you know, he knows he knows nothing about it at all, other than what he's been told by other people who are there. Um, the stories of uh something, you know, a couple of tragic stories where a pilot has uh passed away, um fallen unconscious in the front seat, and the navigator has had to eject and leave them because they didn't have the system that ejects both seats. Uh, you had to do it independently. So there's no um, there's no set way of doing it. It's your last chance, eject, eject, pull the handle, and then start the rest of your life, hopefully. Yeah, Ian's story was amazing. He's lucky to be alive, let alone be able to walk still, oh, isn't he? I mean, he's, he really, really is. His story of survival uh, is, a, is astonishing. And the journey mm -hmm. continues today. Yeah. There's a question from Gemma May, which I think is probably my daughter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, she says, um, how do you keep yourself calm in those situations? In dangerous situations. Hi, Gemma. Um, I think uh, a number of different things. So first of all, you're not always calm. I think that's really important to say. Uh, there are absolute and utter moments of panic. But for me, they last for kind of a nanosecond. And training certainly helps. So in the military, part of your day-to-day -day training is to prepare for events that you hope will never happen. But if you've thought about them, if you've trained for them, if you've practiced them, when they do happen, then at least you've got something to uh, to hold back, to, to, to grab hold of. Um, and knowledge that sometimes there's nothing that you can do about the situation. Uh, and so you have to wait and see what happens that you might have to wait half a second you might have to wait 30 seconds you might have to wait an hour a day depending on what kind of what loss of control it is either and i don't just mean loss of control of an aircraft i mean loss of control of a situation in your life or anything um a knowledge that it will get better i still hold on to that a knowledge that uh it will get better you will you will get through it uh, and if you don't, there's nothing to worry about anyway. You can't, you can't affect it. Um, and holding on to the notion that you'll come out the other side. You'll get out the other side. That's a good answer. Um, there's one um, a second ago that she's, she's gone. Um, it said, would you like to fly the latest high-tech aircraft? No. Or navigate? Thank you. No, thank you for asking. Uh, no, the F-35... <laughs> The latest aircraft um, is an astonishing aircraft. Uh, it's ejection seat. So we talked at the beginning about Joe Lancaster, who, uh, when he ejected in 1949, it took him 30 seconds to get out and to get under the parachute. For me, it was two and a half seconds and fully automatic, but I still had to pull my own yellow and black ejection handle. Um now, on the, on the F-35, the seat is so technological and it's, it's linked digitally into the aircraft. The aircraft talks to the seat, the seat talks to the aircraft. And in certain situations, if the seat believes that the pilot is in mortal danger, the seat will eject the pilot with no further reference, with no buy or leave or if I may. So the first the pilot might know is that they are under a parachute. And it'll do that in 1.75 seconds. Um, That's no time at all, is it? Yeah. Um, right. There was one, I think it was from Sandra. Um, she said she's ordered your book and it hasn't arrived yet. I can't see it on here. I'm trying to remember it. Um, she, you're right. She did. She did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there, oh, there you go. Um, 
Uh, has there ever been a case, to your knowledge, where the ejector seat has failed in some yeah. way? Yes, many. Uh, not so. That's that's unfair. Not many. Some, and there are a couple of instances in the book, in the book. Where, where the system has failed, not because of a fault with the ejection seat or a flaw in its design. It is all the ones that we know of was about something to do with the post maintenance. So once the seat's installed in the aircraft or handed over uh, to the Air Force, it's normally to do with the maintenance of the seat or maintenance of the aircraft, which means that the the, the system has failed and people have lost their lives, no doubt about it. Mm. Uh, I think there was one more question, was there? Or... I can't see it on mine. Uh, from Jude. Have you ever visited the Tornado Heritage Centre um, at Horwarden? Fascinating artifacts there, including an ejector seat, food, tools, etc. What food so that we used to take? Food? Well, it must be quite old food or something, is it? I haven't been to the Tornado Heritage Centre, in actual fact. Uh, I'm looking for an ejection seat for a, a, an event, so I might give them, a, give them a call and see what it is, in actual fact. I'm going to write that down. You keep it. Um, okay, I'll see if there's any more. Um, uh, right, okay. Another one from Jude. Um, from my photo on here on my profile in the Strike Master at Horridon, I was told not to touch anything uh, black and yellow. Black and yellow was everywhere. Uh, where else is it placed? Uh, black and yellow is the sign for danger. Oh, strike Master. Mm. Uh, on all of our aircraft. And so ejection handles, canopy jettison. Uh, emerge, things like emergency oxygen, so anything that's got a black and yellow handle, don't touch it unless you know what you're doing. It's an emergency, <laughs> definitely. Okay, are there any more questions? I think there are. Um, cool. Well, I, I just want to apologize to everyone for the technical hitches our internet went down here and um yeah if you saw me on screen going oh my god <laughs> apologies again but i hope you've really enjoyed the evening and uh yep jude's got another question so i'll hand over to jude who's asking how is your neck <laughs> Oh, I, I had a bit of an incident. So my, as you see me bouncing around in the seat, my neck's still sore, so I can't sit for too long. So I think, are we, oh, that's per, almost an excellent question, Jude. Thank you for asking, uh, especially as I think we're probably coming to the, t the end of our session. But it's, it's, better than it was, it's, it's better than it was, but still not fully fixed yet. Right, I think that's... Um the end of the interview um so to speak um thank you so much uh for chatting to me it's a pleasure um, steve julia thank you for hosting it thank you uh for being a good independent bookshop and selling our books uh, keep oh, up the thank work. You. Thanks for having me. well like i said to you john it's our best-selling book this week so it only came out last thursday and we've sold quite a few copies and there's some more comments coming up just saying thanks for the great talk uh really enjoyed it can't wait to have the next interview with you with the next book let's hope yeah that <laughs> was well i haven't written it yet julia so ah, well. okay <laughs> <laughs> well enjoy the the celebrating of number two in the sunday times bestseller right, thank you. fantastic and it's okay well, thanks for everyone, Father's Day everyone well. for tuning in tonight i hope you enjoyed it and we've got a few signed copies left in the book nook bookshop so if you want to get your copy you can either order it online or pop into the book nook but thanks again guys all right hope you had a good evening thanks, Steve, thanks very much thank Steve you. thanks for the interview very well done Julia thank you I'll thank see you, you again sometime see you soon thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye bye